Hello everyone and welcome to GYN Histology Basics. I'm Kyle Devins. I'm currently a resident at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania and will soon start as a GYN and GU Pathology Fellow at the Massachusetts General Hospital. I also do educational pathology on Twitter uh, at the handle at MDKyle. And today we're going to be talking about benign endometrium, and I've sort of divided it into two sections. Part one, we'll just talk about the basic pre- and post-menopausal endometrium. And in part two, we'll talk about some mimics, some metaplasias, and some artifacts that can kind of get in the way of this interpretation. This video is designed for early residents who are just starting their experience in GYN pathology, or also medical students who are interested in pathology. Let's jump right in and get started. Here we have a section from a hysterectomy specimen showing a nicely oriented portion of endometrium. And on the right side of your screen, you'll notice that this space uh, is right here. This is the endometrial cavity. This is that space at the center of the uterus, which is lined by the endometrium. On the left-hand side of your screen, we have the myometrium, which is that thick, smooth muscle wall around the uterus. And this would continue off the screen. It's much thicker than we've captured here. The endometrium itself is what we're focusing on today, and that is split up into glands, which I will point out here. And between the glands are the endometrial stroma, and those support and give structure to the glands. The endometrium itself is also split into functional portions. The stratum basalis is at the base of the endometrium. It is the area that is minimally responsive to the hormonal changes of the menstrual cycle. And it's the portion that serves to replenish and regenerate the endometrium uh, at the end of each cycle. The stratum functionalis is the superficial portion. This is the area that responds to hormones. It looks different depending on the phase of the cycle that we're in. And I'll go more into more detail in that in the upcoming slides. And it's also the portion that is shed during menses at the beginning of every cycle and is then regenerated. Here is the somewhat simplified chart that we'll be using for this particular talk. This is based on an average 28-day cycle. There is an incredible amount of variability in this, both between cycles and the same woman, and especially between women in terms of the length of the cycle. Most of that variability comes between day zero and day 14 on this chart. That can take uh, you know, considerably differing amounts of time. However, after ovulation on day 14, the time from there until the start of the menses is usually about 14 days, and that does stay somewhat consistent. Because of that, some people try to break down the secretory phase uh, into a little more granularity than we have here, um, but I'm just gonna keep it simple and allow you to recognize the menstrual or shedding phase between day zero and day five, the proliferative endometrium that exists between uh, the end of menses and ovulation, and then the secretory endometrium, which dominates during the luteal phase of the cycle after ovulation. The images we'll be looking at today are going to be a little bit different than what I showed you in that first slide, because I'm going to show you samples from biopsy specimens, uh, biopsies and curatage specimens uh, obtain just fragments and bits of the endometrium. And those are the types of specimens that we see more often it's the type of specimen that is used to initially evaluate a suspected problem with the endometrium, such as abnormal uterine bleeding or a thickened endometrial stripe seen on ultrasound. Hysterectomy, uh, obviously, as many of you know, is the actual removal of the uh, uterus. And in those situations, you can get a nice oriented uh, section of the endometrium all the way down to the myometrium, as I showed on the first slide. But really, the sample you're going to be seeing most often is like this one on the top, which is from a biopsy uh, and just shows fragments of endometrium. So we're going to be looking at mostly biopsies today. Let's talk about the proliferative endometrium first. So that is the endometrium uh, that we're seeing here, average between days 5 and day 14 of the cycle. And you'll notice immediately at low power here, the specimen looks very blue. The stroma is quite cellular, and the glands themselves are cellular. But you'll notice that there's a decent spacing between the glands. It's pretty even. Uh, there's no uh, areas that look really crowded with glands, which is a good thing, because usually we're evaluating this for pathologies such as hyperplasia. And this specimen looks pretty well spaced out, so no hyperplasia here. 
you'll notice also that the contour of the glands looks very round from low power. Here's a few examples, and that's important as we compare it to other types of endometrium at other phases of the cycle. As we go to higher power, you'll note again uh, that the glands are made up of columnar pseudostratified cells. So uh, these columnar cells are really tightly bunched together. That's kind of what gives them a blue appearance at low power, just being so cellular. As you look even higher power, you'll notice that there are multiple mitotic figures in each of these glands, um, which you can see right here. That's an example of a mitotic figure. So all of those are features of proliferative phase endometrium. And just to review them quickly, at low power you have this blue appearance, you have round glands, you have regular even spacing, and then at higher power you can notice that the glands are pseudostratified and that they have multiple mitotic figures. Let's move on to secretory endometrium now, and that's what we're going to be seeing uh, in the phases following ovulation. In the luteal phase of the cycle, between ovulation and the start of the uh, menses. So let's start off here at low power on this biopsy of secretory endometrium. You'll notice right off the bat that in contrast to the proliferative endometrium, this biopsy looks very pink at low power because it's not quite as cellular and has more cytoplasm in the cells overall. You'll notice that between the glands is a lot of cleared out space indicated by my arrow here. This is edema in the stroma, and this is very common, especially early on in the secretory phase. You'll also notice that the gland contour looks different here. So instead of those nice round glands of the proliferative phase, we have really irregularly shaped glands, and in some areas they look a little bunched together. And that's okay, that's sort of an innate feature of secretory endometrium, and does not necessarily mean that there's hyperplasia going on. As we take a look at higher power, we'll notice that there's a few changes that take place in the glands themselves. First off, we get the development quite early on in the secretory phase of these subnuclear vacuoles, which are these cleared out bubbles that appear in the cytoplasm between the nucleus and the basement membrane. And those occur early on in the secretory period. As the secretory period persists, you will also get vacuoles um, above the nucleus, supranuclear vacuoles. And then eventually both vacuoles will go away and you'll just wind up with pink cells. You'll also notice that in the secretory phase, the nuclei are lined up in more of a single layer rather than being pseudostratified and piling on top of each other like they do in the proliferative phase. And that's part of the reason that these cells look more pink at lower power. They have more cytoplasm and they're not as bunched together with the nuclei. As I mentioned, later on in the secretory phase, the vacuoles in the cells disappear, and you wind up with just these pink cells, as you can see on this slide. The cells also tend to get shorter and shorter throughout the secretory phase, until towards the end they can really just look like cuboidal cells rather than columnar, because they're so short. Another thing you'll notice is that the stroma changes as you get later in the secretory phase. So we had lots of edema at the beginning, but as the phase progresses, you start to get pre-decidual change in the stroma. And this means that the stroma starts to gain pink cytoplasm, and this starts around the glands, uh, as you can see here. And I'll show you a little bit more of that later on. You can also start getting secretions within the lumen of the glands, which gives the secretory phase its name. Here's just a higher power view, where you can really see that these columnar cells are getting shorter and becoming more cuboidal as the phase progresses. Here is a view of late phase secretory endometrium, and here you can see that the decidual change has progressed, and now it is uh, connecting between the glands, and it even extends to the surface of the endometrium. So let's look at our secretory endometrium quick points. At low power, you have a pink appearance, you have irregularly shaped glands, which can be crowded in some areas, at higher power, you have a single layer of columnar cells, which become more cuboidal as the phase progresses. And you also have predecidual change, which starts around the glands and then progresses to involve more of the stroma as you get later in the secretory phase. Next, let's take a look at the changes we see during the menstrual or shedding phase at the beginning of the cycle. The menstrual phase endometrium is characterized by endometrial stromal breakdown. In stromal breakdown, we see dense aggregates of stromal cells that form these really dark blue clusters that we can see at low power here. 
You'll also notice that many of the glands here are floating without any stroma between them. This can make some of the glands look closer together when in reality there would not be any crowding. So because of that, we can't really assess for hyperplasia during a breakdown endometrium. So it's important to note when this is occurring. With that, let's quickly summarize our menstrual phase endometrium. Again, it is characterized by stromal breakdown, so you'll see dense aggregates of stroma admixed with blood and inflammatory cells. At higher power, if you looked at these glands, you could tell that they have a variable appearance. You might see some glands that look like late secretory. You might see some that look like they're starting to go into more of a proliferative phase. And that's because it's sort of at the border between those two phases. And again, you can't really assess for glandular crowding here or hyperplasia because there's really no stroma between any of the glands. So it's important to note when you are in stromal breakdown so that you don't overcall glandular crowding. Lastly, let's take a look at the postmenopausal endometrium. As a woman progresses into menopause and the endometrium undergoes a longer period of time without estrogen exposure, it can become atrophic. And that's really represented well on this slide. With atrophy, you often have a scant specimen and you wind up with hairpin glands, which are detached from the stroma, which you can see right here. That hairpin appearance refers to the way that these glands are sort of single layer, detached, and folded. If you take a closer look at the glands, you can see that these glands are lined by a single layer of epithelial cells, which are either low columnar or cuboidal. It's also not uncommon to see metaplasias during this phase, which can complicate the interpretation and will be covered in more detail in my next video. These are often specimens that are admixed with blood as well, and atrophy itself can be a cause of endometrial bleeding, so it can be a reason that these patients undergo biopsy. So it's important to be aware of. Here's our atrophy quick point. So at low power, you'll notice that the specimen is scant. It's often made up of really thin strips of epithelia making up the glands, which are detached from the stroma. And at higher power, you see that these glands are made up of low columnar cells or cuboidal cells. And that's it for part one. Thanks for joining us. I hope you'll also join for part two, where we talk about metaplasias and artifacts. If you have any questions, feel free to tweet them at me, and I will do my best to answer them as they come. Thanks for joining.